Welcome to the New Books Network. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to New Books in Diplomatic History, a podcast channel on the New Books Network. I'm Andrew Pace, the host of the channel. Our guest today is Edward Kaplan, the Dean of the School of Strategic Land Power at the U.S. Army War College in Carlisle, Pennsylvania. And today we'll be talking about his newest book, The End of Victory, Prevailing in the Thermonuclear Age, which was published by Cornell University Press in 2022. Hi, Ed. Welcome to the show. Yeah. Hi, Andrew. Thank you for having me. In your previous book, which bears the fabulous title of To Kill Nations, (laughs) you traced the evolution of MAD, Mutually Assured Destruction. And now in this book, The End of Victory, you practice a lot of what Herman Kahn called thinking about the unthinkable, uh, that is winning a nuclear war. So to start off, could you tell us a little bit about yourself and how how did you come to be interested in the most destructive forms of air and land power? Uh, well, I'll start out um, answering the question about uh, a little bit about who I am. So I uh, grew up in the 80s. Uh, and uh, was on Long Island, and uh, that was the era of uh, the, the the renewed Cold War with Reagan uh, talking about the evil empire. And I remember that as a little kid, uh, and the KAL crisis, and uh, with the the shoot down over Korea, and that got me really interested in uh, in this rivalry between the superpowers and. Uh, sparked an interest in military history and understanding uh, what was going on in the world at that time as much as I could at that age. But uh, the Cold War seemed to be uh, something that was going to be eternal, and then suddenly it wasn't. And I watched the wall fall. Uh, and I also saw the the tanks in Tiananmen Square. And uh, I knew that history was something that I wanted to understand and study, and that military history as a part of it was interesting. Um, while I was uh, growing up and uh, in high school uh, on Long Island, I would go to West Point periodically uh, because West Point would host wargaming conventions and they would host uh, science Olympiads. And I fell in love with the military academies. And I I thought this would be a, a, an interesting thing to do for a kid from Long Island. Mm-hmm. Uh, didn't come from a military background because uh, I wanted to do something that I owned uh, where my success or failure was because of what I did uh, and not where I came from. So uh, I decided to go to the Air Force Academy and uh, I became a military history major within a month of arriving and uh, was very happy to uh, continue that through my Air Force career, which uh, was something I think the Air Force was uh, quite generous about in sponsoring me for uh, graduate degrees. But uh, throughout my Air Force career as an intelligence officer, I interwove uh, my graduate school experience and also giving back to the Air Force by being a teacher at the Air Force Academy uh, as an instructor, as the head of the military history program, and then uh, for a a short time as the acting department head for history uh, before I came to the Army War College. So that interest in air power, uh, being in the Air Force, and that interest in the Cold War uh, started to become really uh, come to a head in the intersection, which was nuclear weapons and trying to understand them. Uh, Because they'd been such a big part of my beginning to understand where I was in the world in, in the early 80s with the Cold War. So... When I did my master's degree in the mid '90s, uh, I started out by looking at the British atomic bomb program and trying to understand how that program came into being and how it married up to operational history. So, what did the bomber command, British bomber command, look like after World War II, and how did it build a deterrent force? Uh, and so that introduced me to themes that I was going to have through the rest of my Uh, academic life of thinking about nuclear weapons and how operational history ties into higher levels of strategy and grand strategy. And 
that's kind of at the root of what happened with um, to kill, both turned into kill nations. And I wanted to look at the ideas of atomic weapons and how they fit into operational and then strategic thinking. Because the narrative as I saw it, which seemed to be the, the commonly accepted narrative, took as almost a, a gospel the ideas of the early nuclear civilian nuclear strategists. Uh, that ideas that are really rooted in what we call coercion theory uh, as the only use of nuclear weapons, of, of how they should be effectively used, uh, that any other thinking about it is not well-grounded, doesn't really make any sense, that that was anachronistic thinking uh, and that it was missing a whole period of the evolution of atomic thought. And for nuclear weapons to, in 1945, to suddenly be seen as a non-military weapon would be almost unthinkable. Um, they were part of air power theory, and they were a way of carrying out air power theory from the interwar years and as executed during World War II, but with instant mass. And they married the idea of being able to destroy any target at the outbreak of war with the idea of destroying enemy industry uh, as the way to win a conflict. And so that idea, the air atomic period, flowed through the 40s into the 50s and into the early 60s and became almost in impossible to uh, continue having as an operational thought just because it became un unwinnable. Mm -hmm. And so nuclear weapons became divorced from air power theory in the early 60s. And that's ultimately what led to ideas of assured destruction. Uh, but there's a story to be told there about how new weapons fold into existing ideas and then how they're applied to national strategy. And I think there's a great danger in reading backwards from the present day and making assumptions about how ideas make their way into operational practice. Right. So I'm sorry, that was a, it was a very long answer. Uh, no, to that, your, that's perfect. But um, I, I hope that gives you an idea of where I came from on this. Yeah, and, and I found it interesting that um, you know, many histories of nuclear weapons focus on uh, these larger than life personalities, Albert Einstein, Robert Oppenheimer, Edward Teller, Curtis LeMay, um, these sort of nuclear celebrities that Fred Kaplan called the wizards of Armageddon. Um, but your book focuses on uh, a, a top secret, almost uh, mysteriously obscure committee uh, that I had never even heard of the the net evaluation subcommittee, <laughs> and it, it it sounds so boring. Mm -hmm. um, but as one of my friends recently wrote about executive focus groups, the more mundane the title, the more important the committee likely is. <laughs> um, so, what was the net evaluation subcommittee, the NESC, and what was its purpose? So the Nendabayashin Subcommittee uh, was a way of establishing the risk of nuclear war and the failure of nuclear strategy. And if we look at risk as an equation uh, of the probability of an event uh, combined, multiplied by the severity of the event, we're used to looking at the intelligence community's estimates and them, the IC telling us what the probability of something happening is. But that wasn't enough to do, to make decisions about strategy with nuclear weapons. You had to understand, or at least President Truman thought he did, and then Eisenhower after him, uh, what the severity of failure would be in order to make a, a, a true decision as to what risks you were gonna run. And what the NESC did was it was established to determine the severity of failure. And initially, uh, it grew out of NSC 68. Uh -huh. And NSC 68, there were a number of annexes and follow-on reports in its series. And one of them was NSC 68 TAC 4, which looked at the threat to the United States from the Soviet Union. But when that report came out of the NSC, it was almost wholly incomplete. 
uh, it talked about the internal threat to the United States uh, subversion, uh, and really it had an internal security focus. And that clearly wasn't enough, right? There would be a there was a nascent Soviet threat. Maybe it wasn't really a, a, a big threat in 1951-52 when that report was being written, but it would be soon. And Truman understood that that was a problem. And so he asked the head of the CIA, uh, Walter Burdell Smith, to figure out what the problem was. And he identified it as a, an example we call the old G2, G3 problem. So the problem was that the intelligence community people didn't have access to the war plans. Mm -hmm. And the war plans people were holding on to them really tightly and didn't want to to give anything to the intel people. Of course, the, the accusation usually flows the other way, that the intel people hold on to their secrets very tightly and don't give it to the operators. But that the vision worked in both directions. And what that meant was that it was impossible for the intelligence community to write the report that Truman needed. So he needed another organization to do it. And the only organization in the government that had the potential from a just a structural point of view to direct both the intelligence community and the operational community in the Pentagon to give the information they needed in order to make an assessment was the National Security Council. And so Truman established the Special Evaluation Subcommittee uh, and it wrote a report, its first report in 1953. So it came out, was given to Eisenhower, but it was started under the Truman administration. Mm -hmm. uh, that it answered a single question, which is what would happen if American strategy failed in its worst possible mode and the Soviets launched a surprise attack on the United States? And it projected three years forward from the current day. So it looked at 1955 programs and assumed that the intelligence community estimate of whatever the Soviets were going to do was accurate and that American programs, as they were projected would reach whatever stage of development they would by 1955. And what would a conflict between the two countries look like if the Soviets launched an assault? And so they had the Air Force look at Soviet assets and look at American defenses and come up with the best plan they could for attacking America. And they gamed it out against projected American defenses and came up with their report. And then that report was so good uh, and told such a, an important story to Eisenhower that he renewed the committee for 1954 and then made it a standing committee starting in 1955. So at that, at that point, the committee was a secretive part of, a secret and secretive part of the National Security Council. Didn't appear on org charts, uh, only a, a very small number of people knew it even existed. Uh, for example, the planners for nuclear uh, war plans in the Pentagon did not know it existed. Mm. Uh, and there were only a couple of times when they, they heard hints that there was something that someone had done a study and they wanted to get hold of it and they were denied access to it. The head of the committee was the chairman of the Joint Chiefs. Uh, and he was he didn't run it on a daily basis. So instead, they took a retired three-star officer, someone who knew exactly where to go to get information but was no longer beholden to their service because they were tired. And a staff of anywhere from a half dozen to maybe 20 or 30 by the end of uh, the NESC's existence. And every year they would do an annual report that would look three to five years ahead and would have different scenarios of tactical surprise or strategic surprise on the Soviet side. And then eventually they started adding the results of American retaliation. Uh, and even different modes of American attack uh, and initiative to figure out what would happen in different circumstances. And then that information became an important element of deciding what we would do with respect to strategic decisions for what we would seek in a nuclear war, but also decisions about force structure. What do we build and what don't we build uh, in order to try to get the best possible outcome, even if we couldn't get a good outcome. Okay. So in a sense, these are like atomic actuaries managing 
nuclear risk. Is that right? And and they're and they're practicing net evaluation. Can can you tell us a little bit about like what that methodology involves? Sure. Uh, so they, they were. So first, we'll look at the net. So the net means you can't evaluate what they're trying to do with only looking at one side. You can't just look at the Soviets and say what the risk is. And you can't just look at American force structure and say what the United States is going to do is the only thing that's important. Instead, the way to evaluate the severity of the attack that the Soviets could launch was you had to look at both sides and how they interacted. And it's that interaction that was the critical part that the NESC could do that no one else could because the NESC had access to the data from the IC and from the war plans. And it was the interaction of Soviet offensive forces wielded using the best plans that we could figure they could use, which I think is a weakness of the, the NESC's methodology mm -hmm. um, because it doesn't say what actual Soviet usage would be because that was not available. Uh, but so SAC was doing a lot of mirror imaging because uh, Strategic Air Command or SAC was uh, really the that provided the Air Force officers that did a lot of the attack right. uh, planning. But how that offensive would interact with American defensive plans. And so they did simulations. Uh, sometimes the simulations were run one or two times. Uh, and the details are still classified and unavailable uh, for exactly how they did it. But I, one thing that is clear is that in 19, because in 1955, they did a live month long simulation down at Air War College down in uh, Maxwell Air Force Base in Alabama that involved a whole lot of players who were free to make whatever decisions they wanted, uh, as opposed to having it a scripted attack where the planes were going to come in one way and the defenses would react as best they could. Mm -hmm. Because it was free play, that implies that the others were not. Uh, right. Right. That was uh, that 1955 exercise came in for very uh, strong criticism from the Navy. Uh, because of the the assessed weakness of carrier-based aviation in a potential nuclear attack or or in a retaliation to a Soviet attack. Uh, so what that tells us is the early, earliest were uh, simulations were done manually uh, and were largely scripted. You had in the 1955 free play. And then after that, we saw multiple scenarios being executed. And starting in 56, they start to be executed using some of the earliest computers with computing computing time borrowed from other government agencies. Oh, okay. And uh, I would theorize, but I don't have the, uh, you know, the, the documentary evidence, but I would theorize that that adding of the computer, computing power to calculating a, uh, yeah, you know, the interceptions and the bomber, uh, you know, the bomb effects and so forth, allowed them to run multiple scenarios, which is what we start seeing in '56 and '57. Is the reports instead of having one scenario they report on, they have four or five variants of a scenario, uh, and they report on how those different variables, which are potential force structures that the U.S. could have often or the uh, that the Soviets might have how those would interact. And again, it was the net effect of those things. So a high level of Soviet uh, uh, bomber building, for example, again, stay low level of US defenses. What would that look like? And then a high level of US defenses with tactical surprise against a, a low level of uh, Soviet offensive forces. And so they, would, they were able to do that, I think, largely through uh, integrating computing power into what they did. And then, then after that, they start getting to some specialized reports as they begin to move to the end of the Eisenhower administration and into the Kennedy administration. Uh, but the basic annual report was there every year up through 1964. Right. So this is a top secret committee uh, that officials at the Pentagon don't even know about. It reports directly to the president, right? And there are only... Uh, I think it, I think you said that there were only three copies of uh, each report that were even made, three physical copies. Right. So, how how did you how did you find these? How did you how did you access them um, for the book? Well, this is where I have to uh, give a shout out to uh, Dr. William Burr at uh, the National Security Archive. Uh, 
uh, and the amazing work that he is doing every day along with the other people at the archive uh, on submitting FOIA requests on documents that they know exist because they see it in the rest of the documentary record uh, and the, their amazing persistence in uh, hunting those down and making uh, that information available to historians. So uh, I first ran across it uh, in 2004 in copy, the, one of the three copies of the NESC reports was kept in what the Eisenhower administration called the emergency file. And it was those copies that uh, Bill Burr uh, was able to get partially released, uh, the summary reports of those. And that's what I saw in 2004. 10 years later, uh, his persistence got the rest of the summary reports and uh, including some of the specialized reports uh, released with different degrees of redaction. Some of them were still heavily redacted, but others were largely uh, released. Now, there is one exception, and that is the initial special evaluation subcommittee report was in FRUS. Uh, so it's in the uh, initial foreign relations of the United States volume on national security during the Truman administration. And that very well may be how uh, Burr and other uh, people who looked at this before me uh, were able to knew that there was something there uh, that this would continue. So that is uh, uh, how you, how you get access to it is really through the the teamwork of historians building on each other's work. Uh, and without the National Security Archive, there's no way I would have uh, ever even known that this existed. And, and these are a fascinating collection of uh, reports. That you know, as as you say, go through the the process of thinking about uh, nuclear warfare, what a surprise Soviet attack would look like, what an American uh, counterattack or, or retaliatory strikes would look like, and um, and I found that you know one of the most chilling aspects of these reports were these attempts to analyze and quantify and predict what a, a nuclear holocaust would look like, and the the sheer scale of uh, what they were talking about is, um, is, is sort of mind-boggling. Um, the the report from 1958, for instance, um, mentions that blast overpressure would damage buildings over 4% of the country's area in a, a Soviet attack. And uh, it says after, a, you, you wrote that after a year, um, after a, 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 su a surprise Soviet attack, radiation would combine with the initial attack to kill 50 million people. Um, all survivors would suffer from a shattered medical system. Radiation would halt ground transport. Um, the banking system would devolve into barter for at least a year, the report continues. Um, only the vice president and secretary of the interior would survive on the federal side. Uh, but most state governments, it says, would, would be intact. Um, recovery would have to begin below the national level until the federal government could reconstitute. That's that's just a, a staggering scenario to think about. Um, can, can you, I guess, talk about some of the casualty numbers uh, that, that they were using in some of these reports, both for a, a, so, a Soviet attack and American retaliation? Well, uh, I mean, you're, you're quoting uh, one of the reports that is kind of after an inflection point in their studies. Um, the earlier reports, uh, 53 and 54, are looking at a period where the Americans have overwhelming superiority, uh, and also it's before Soviet weapons are in the megaton scale, so are thermonuclear, oh, so right. just kiloton scale. Uh, still large weapons, but the kinds of casualties they're predicting in those early reports are on this on the order of magnitude of what the Soviet Union suffered in World War II. Now, it would be suffered in the matter of days, weeks, and months, right? If you we're talking about fallout. Right. But it was comprehensible in terms of World War II. Uh, after that, uh, really after the Soviet arsenal gets larger thermonuclear weapons in large numbers, uh, so a, a thermonuclear plenty was the I needed a term for it, so I invented that. Um, and I, I caught some uh, some grief from yeah. uh, a couple of my colleagues here who read the book and 
uh, said that they now had a, a, a brand new word or, or phrase to use. Um, and this is in like 54, 55 as their right. arsenal they're, is growing? Right. So they're projecting forward. Um, oh, I see. So they're looking in 55 at about 58 or so. Uh, in 54, they're looking at 57. Mm -hmm. So if the Soviet stockpile grows at the rate that the intelligence community predicts, how many thermonuclear weapons might they have? And then using that middle case, right, because there's a, a worst case and a best case in these national intelligence estimates that they're using, uh, what would that number of bombs, how many of those would be deliverable, would reach target, and then if they reach the target, how much damage would they do? Now, one thing to point out, uh, if you use Lynn Eden's work, uh, is that the calculations they're doing are based solely on blast. So the the blast, the thermal and the radiation are the three ways that a nuclear weapon causes damage. Uh, of those three, the blast is the only one that is predictable. So for military planning purposes, the U.S. baked into its documents and its tools for planning uh, only blast damage. So that means that what they're doing, what they're estimating, uh, is much more difficult to actually come up with casualty figures because things like firestorms and radiation depend a lot on environmental conditions. Right. And those can't be predicted ahead of time. Mm -hmm. So the reason that they, and this is, you know, Lynn Eden's work again, uh, the reason that they're doing that blast only is because they have to have a reliable way to calculate their probability of kill against a target. And especially if that target is what in the terminology of the day was called a blunting target, uh, looking to blunt the Soviet offensive. If they're going to hit a Soviet bomber base or a Soviet command bunker, they need to know that they are hitting it with a an assurance of 0.99 or 0.95 or 0.7. And that is something they could calculate based on reliable blast, but they couldn't count on radiation or thermal, so they ignored it. What that means for the damage that they're projecting is it's much harder for them to estimate with the tools they had what the damage to American cities and to American uh, population would be from fire, firestorms and radiation and fallout. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, is, is that, please go ahead. No, no, no. So it, it, you also point out, though, that that these uh, that these evaluations raised the, the question of how to reconcile the, the the incongruity of nuclear weapons and political objectives. Um, if you're if you are destroying your enemy uh, so thoroughly uh, and so completely, what what possible political aim might that serve? Um, and so you <clears throat> you you highlight in your book how um, the, the the growth uh, of of nuclear arsenals and their destructive power um, ended uh, American uh, sort of um, tolerance or reliance on victory. Uh, and specifically, you talk about these two sort of revolutions in um, American, well, two, two events that really uh, changed American thinking. One, you mentioned this Soviet thermonuclear plenty, um, and the other one, which is more well known, uh, which is Sputnik and uh, the uh, rise of uh, nuclear missiles, ICBMs. Um, can can you tell us about those two revolutions and how they uh, challenged uh, American assumptions and thinking about nuclear weapons and about victory? Sure. So the first of those, I think, is often overlooked uh, when we look at that period because Sputnik was such a public event. Uh, I think it, it looms large in American memory uh, as a moment where the Soviets had a line up. Right. Uh, but from the perspective of American nuclear strategy, the, the air atomic strategy is based on the idea uh, that you attack industry in order to uh, destroy the ability of a modern industrial state to wage war. Mm -hmm. In those theories... The idea that the enemy has an offensive air force that can strike your industry is uh, not well 
thought through as to what the consequences were because there was no real answer to that other than to strike the enemy first. The original thought, if you look back to Duhay uh, as an example, is that defense is largely impossible uh, because big sky, little plane, if you have 100 targets that can be hit, you have to have uh, 100 fighters in the air off over every target enough or enough fighters to, to destroy an enemy bomber raid and you simply can't know where the enemy is going. Yeah, the, the bomber will always get through. Right, exactly. Uh, the experience of World War II showed that obviously that was not true. Uh, and one of the points though of the atomic revolution is that it made defense difficult if not impossible yet again. Because now every bomber that gets through with an atomic bomb, it has the equivalent firepower of 220 B-29s. So it's a bomber raid and a bomb. So even if you had a defense that shot down as many bombers as were uh, lost at Schweinfurt in 1943, 20% mm -hmm. of the bombers, 80% uh, of the bombers getting through with every one of those bombers having a potent atomic bomb on it would be devastating. So once again, the, the defenses of World War II were no longer something that could be relied on, even if they were twice as effective and shot down 40% of the bombers. So the only way that air atomic theory could deal with that was to strike the enemy before he left his bases, to destroy the enemy in his nest, to use the term that Duhay did. Mm -hmm. When thermonuclear weapons come along, it magnifies this problem tremendously because now every bomber that gets through isn't just a bomber raid which can devastate a factory and part of a town. It is got the equivalent firepower of every bomb dropped in World War II. And it can destroy any city, any target. So even a small number of Soviet bombers getting through now can cause far more damage than the United States has ever suffered in any conflict and could effectively destroy American society. So that becomes the question, what does winning mean when the thermonuclear revolution has made any general war between the US and the Soviet Union one that's going to devastate both sides. And we see a, a transformation in thinking about what outcomes are possible in nuclear war. Early war plans, before the Soviets have thermonuclear weapons, look in a sense like a reverse World War II. Uh, they depend on something that uh, another historian's called the Detroit Deterrent. I think it's Andrew Erdman. And the idea there is that if the Soviets were to attack Western Europe, we could instantly deploy our bombers and they could launch an assault on Soviet industry, destroy the industry behind the Red Army, and meanwhile, American industry, effectively untouched in America, would mobilize like it did in World War II, and within about two years would have the forces to re-enter Europe. That plan doesn't work anymore in a thermonuclear era because blunting the Soviet bombers becomes the primary target, not disrupting industry. Mm. And that has to be done very effectively in order to truly keep damage down to a minimum. If it becomes impossible, which is what the Net Evaluation Subcommittee was beginning to project in its reports, then we have a situation where both sides are devastated. So what do you do from there? And that enters that uh, enters a period where the United States strategy is focused on the word prevail. And I try to make the division in the book between this early period through about 55, where we have this traditionally sought victory, where tactical success leads to operational success, which leads to strategic success. And instead, we enter a period where the initial battles we'd expect not only to lose, but we expect our society and industrial base to be devastated. So the first step in continuing a nuclear war will be rapid recovery. And the targets that we have to strike are the targets that will keep the enemy from recovering quickly. Because it's the relative rate at which we can recover and then project military force, which will allow us to prevail, to use the new term. But prevailing is very different than traditional victory. And so that leads to, again, the title of the book, uh, The End of Victory, which I mean in two ways. So 
the end of the idea of victory, but also if we talk about ends, ways, and means for strategy, the end of that you're trying to seek is victory. So is it victory anymore? Mm. No, but if you don't have a choice, and that's how Eisenhower views it, that if conflict is going to inevitably become uh, something that escalates out of control, he's a strong believer in Clausewitz, mm -hmm. uh, then your only solution to that is to prepare to strike as hard and as fast as possible so that you can prevail. He does not believe that it's possible to pause in a nuclear war or to send signals to do what we would call coercion uh, in to seek war termination like the, the Kennedy administration tried to do. Instead, if the idea of nuclear war uh, is to, like any conflict, to force the enemy to give up by either destroying his means or his will, to use a Clausewitzian formulation, and he does actually, he uses this Clausewitzian formulation in, in a uh, in a briefing uh, on the NESC, one of the NESC annual reports, when he's talking to uh, the other members of the committee or to the members of the committee, uh, the key is to drive Soviet means to zero, not to try to have them make a choice about surrendering, but to give them no options to continue the war. So if you then add into that revolution, the revolution of missiles, which shrinks the time in which an attack can take place, from hours to minutes. So instead of getting 10 hours of tactical warning of Soviet bombers coming over the pole from the distant early warning line, we have 15 minutes from the early ballistic missile radars. Now we have another element to prevailing. So not only do we have to strike every target, we have to do it as rapidly as possible and to try to get ahead of Soviet missiles before they take off. And if they don't, then we still have to strike those targets because we don't want the Soviets to reload and to get a second wave of missiles in or to recover their bombers at their bases. So by the end of the 50s, you have these huge numbers of weapons, which are all on a hair trigger to launch. And the only option that's built into the war plan is the option to execute it. The, the first PSYOP, PSYOP 62, Single Integrated Operations Plan, has 14 options in it. But those options are only options based on the amount of tactical warning we have between one and 14 hours. For Eisenhower, launching a nuclear war is like flipping an on-off switch. It is not a rheostat like we would get in the Kennedy administration where it can be finely tuned in order to send a signal. Yeah. And that and that seems to be one of the major differences between uh, you know, Eisenhower and, and Dulles' massive retaliation and Kennedy's, you know what you call controlled response or flexible response. Um, <clears throat> so you, you, you lay out how these reports helped, um, you know, American decision makers realize that victory was impossible, basically, uh, that there was uh, no way to, to win. And so they focus on prevailing. Um, but I'm, I'm wondering to what extent committee members also um, thought about these issues, you know, ethically. Um, what, you know, there, there, there's a great anecdote that you have about the first time JFK got a briefing about PSYOP 62. This is in, I think this is in September of 61. And he asks as he's, as they're briefing him on these, uh, these, uh, nuclear retaliation plans. Um, he asked why the U.S. was planning to strike China when Beijing had no nuclear weapons. And the answer that he got was simply, well, it's in the plan. And shortly after that, it sounds like the, the meeting ended, he got up, he left, and on his way out, he says to Secretary of State Dean Rusk, and we call ourselves the human race. Mm -hmm. uh, and there, you, know, you point to this sort of... Um, level of disgust that he had about contemplating nuclear war uh, against the the entire communist world. Um, were there other instances like that where committee members were, were not just wrestling with uh, the analytical ramifications of, you know, how, how to carry out this attack or, or how many or what survives, but, you know, is, is, is victory 
set, setting aside whether it's possible, is victory moral? Is that even an aim that should be considered in a nuclear uh, scenario? The, the horror of their conclusions does come out of the page in many of the reports when they're talking about, even in the, this bureaucratic dry language, uh, about the devastation to American society and, uh, and to Soviet society as well in the later reports where they talk about retaliation. Uh, the inner workings of the committee are largely opaque. Uh, we don't have access to that. I, I would be surprised if those records even still exist given that they only kept three copies of the final reports. Uh, the problem with that is, is, though, that the initial scenario that they have is to assume that the decision to launch a nuclear war has already been made. Mm -hmm. And that that is a decision that the president takes, and it's not something that the Amer that the the military who are executing it are making this the only way forward for them through their logic at least in the 50s is to as rapidly as possible destroy the opponent in order to save as many american lives as possible and there's a statement i i don't have it in that book i think i have it in in to kill nations uh where uh, LeMay is la later asked about the uh, morality of nuclear war. He says, no, no war is moral. So you may as well have the shortest war you can so that you can recover. I'm paraphrasing a little bit, but uh, the idea, and I think this comes out of you know, a half century of unrestrained conflict in World War One and World War II, um, that the only way to win is to prevent the enemy from being able to fight at all. And you had to do whatever you could to bring that about. And when you're dealing with a an enemy who is being framed as an ideological opponent who are going to enslave the West and destroy freedom and democracy, which is the, the rhetoric of the time, uh, then there is no negotiation that's going to work past that initial point of deciding on war. And part of that is a lack of trust in negotiation during war because the this belief, which I think was reinforced during Korea, that the that a communist way, again, communist being seen as a, a single block at the time, right. uh, is not to negotiate in good faith. And so if that was being done during a nuclear war, the stakes would be so immense. So you would not even want to try to negotiate with them. Uh, and I think it's also just a, a grim conclusion based on their own experience, lived experience of the Second World War, uh, that there is no appeasement. There is no uh, half measure when you're trying to defeat totalitarianism. So the, the committee goes from focusing on winning a nuclear war to prevailing in a nuclear war, and then ultimately to what you call war termination. Um, what, what, what is war termination, and um, how? Well, let, let's start there. What, what does it mean to, to terminate and, and end a war on those terms? Right. So, and the 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 frame the, the phrase, but the phrase prevailing comes from the strategic documents of the time uh, in the Eisenhower administration, starting in fifty five, in the basic national security policies, and then. Uh -huh. The Net Evaluation Subcommittee tries to define it backwards uh, when they are looking. Uh, they do a report called the, the 2009 report. Uh, they are looking for the optimum mix uh, of uh, nuclear weapons for force structure. And uh, that's at Eisenhower's direction. And they have to work backwards to figure out what does prevailing mean when the president says that. Uh, and so that I'm using that framework uh, when I talk about prevailing. For war termination, it's very explicit in Kennedy's early nuclear documents uh, that war termination is about avoiding an all-out exchange and terminating a conflict on American terms short of that exchange. Mm 
And so effectively, what we're talking about, if we talk about coercion as opposed to brute force, to use Schelling's term, for the Eisenhower administration, both winning and prevailing were in peacetime coercion because it was a form of deterrence. But in wartime, it was the application of brute force. It was brute force against the Soviet Union to cause victory at the strategic level. It was brute force at the operational level against Soviet industry at first, and then their offensive air power and then industry in later years. And then at the tactical level, the weapons were used for their military effect. They were used to destroy a target, to reduce means to zero. In the Kennedy administration, we have coercion operating in more than just peacetime. So whereas coercion stops at the beginning of war for Eisenhower, right? And it's no longer about convincing the Soviets to do something. It's about preventing them from having the ability to do anything. Mm -hmm. Or the Kennedy administration, coercion continues into conflict. And what they want to do is at the operational level, choose targets that demonstrate American will to continue the war and to strike things that the Soviets value and to threaten things further that could be destroyed and lost if the Soviets don't give in to whatever the Americans want. Mm -hmm. And so it's what Herman Kahn would call escalation dominance. Uh, the idea that no matter what the Soviets do, they're going to lose. And so it's in their best interest to terminate the conflict at that moment. And that is at the operational level. At the tactical level, nuclear weapons are now being used for coercion, to send signals. That's very different than being used for brute force. So you can pick a target under Eisenhower as a, a factory or an airfield, and it's being struck for its military effect to destroy the tanks being built in that factory or destroy the aircraft of that airfield. Under Kennedy, the coercive use of nuclear weapons at the tactical level means a target could be chosen for the signal it sends. So it's chosen because it's inside Soviet borders, not because it is an airfield inside the Soviet Union. You could just detonate a weapon in uh, the Black Sea, where there are where there is nobody, in order to send a signal that you're willing to use nuclear weapons and use them in Soviet territory. Mm -hmm. So that is a, uh, a a key difference when it comes to the tactical level that ties into this idea of coercion being used all the way up through the strategic level under the Kennedy administration, and then. Just a year after Kennedy's assassination, uh, this is in December of 64, um, it seems to me that the, the committee ends uh, sort of abruptly. Uh, Secretary of Defense Robert McNamara formally requests that LBJ eliminate um, the NESC. Um, yeah. Why did why, why did McNamara do that? So two, two reasons that I could discern from the records uh, and also from uh, interviewing uh, an ambassador who was the State Department representative in 1963 and 64 on the NASC. He may well have been, when I talked to him, the last surviving member uh, of, the, of the group. So the, the first reason is the one that's in the documents, and that is that the NESC had become largely obsolescent. Uh, it was a redundant analytical organization that was redundant now with the military analytical capability that was now resident in the civilian part of the Defense Department. Whereas in the 1950s, the Defense Department was all about the uh, attempted effective management of the military budget and building and procurement. In other words, it was about uh, building the means for war. It was not about the ways or how or how weapons would be used in war. That was up to the services and up to the president. And with Eisenhower, you had a president who could tell the chiefs uh, exactly how much advice he wanted to take and how much he wanted to dismiss. And that came from his own background. So he had that authority over all of these four-star generals. It was uh, an authority grounded in experience. Kennedy didn't have that. And so he brought the whiz kids uh, into... Pentagon to create a new analytical machinery that could give him military advice because he didn't trust the chiefs and the chiefs might not listen to him. Uh, and he couldn't judge when the, when the chief's advice would be wrong, not at least not with the authority that Eisenhower could or with, and, or with the certainty that Eisenhower could. 
And so McNamara builds first in the comptroller's office under Charlie Hitch, uh, and then later in systems analysis under Alan Enthoven, uh, which starts in 65 after Kennedy's administration uh, ends. But uh, this idea of using economic theory, strategic man or economic man uh, in order to do systems analysis that would uh, very coolly and analytically examine different options of things like force structure and strategy across programs, across services, in order to figure out what was the best uh, for the uh, for national security. Well, with that machinery in place, it was no longer necessary to have a net evaluation subcommittee. The president got the advice he needed from inside the Defense Department. Mm. So that was part of the answer. The other part of the answer was the military controlled through the chairman of the Joint Chiefs being the chairman of the net evaluation subcommittee, uh, controlled the machinery of the NESC. And it was a competitor, in a sense, to that advice coming out of the Defense Department. Right. And so one of the reports, the 1964 report, of which I can't find uh, an actual uh, copy of the summary anywhere, uh, it seems to be uh, absent from the historical record at this point. I hope it surfaces one day. Uh, but from the little we can tell, it it had to. It looked at a, a war in Europe. Uh, and recommendations could be made based on its conclusions that ran contrary to what McNamara was trying to get done in NATO. And so it was a political threat as well, and a separate channel for the military to give advice to the president that was uh, different uh, and perhaps at odds with what the civilian secretary of defense wanted. And McNamara would have no uh, patience at all with uh, the military trying to go around him. So there was ample reason, both in the organizational sense uh, of obsolescence and in the political sense of a competitor for advice to the president, for McNamara to advocate for get, doing away with the NESC. And uh, he proposes it, and President Johnson accepts it. And so at that point, uh, effectively, the, the committee had outlived its usefulness. Right. And it had become a danger uh, to the new, newly empowered uh, civilian part of the Defense Department, uh, which now was actively engaged in making policy and strategy in a way it was not in the 1950s. Yeah. So looking back over the history of the, this subcommittee, um, what would you say are the, the advantages or, or challenges of this kind of, uh, I guess what I would call worst case scenario uh, planning, and 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 more generally, what lessons should historians or strategists and policymakers, uh, what lessons should we take away from the committee's work? Well, I mean, there are a number of general and specific ones um, that I think are are useful for further research and for thinking about. Um, I think one that any historian looking at conflict, whether it's diplomatic, uh, economic, or military, uh, looking at strategy, this the NESC. I think is a a strong statement in favor of always taking the opponent into account that you can't assess risk without looking at what the opponent is going to do. Uh, second is the utility of honest and useful evaluation that is crafted by experts who are organizationally independent of other stakeholders. Uh, and sometimes the utility of having those people protected by secrecy, because the secrecy of what the NESC was doing protected it from public scrutiny and criticism, which could have weighed in on the president. The re those reports had made it to the public. The president could have been under immense pressure to do things that would have been, in his mind, against the best interests of national defense. And so he needed that advice to be candid and secret. Uh, another thing that I think is important here, uh, is the variations of what victory means, what are acceptable outcomes uh, for war, mm -hmm. and whether or not a president or other person deciding on whether to pursue a war feels they have a choice. So I would argue it's not that, Ken that Eisenhower embraced nuclear war and was some sort of a madman. He thought that war inevitably would spiral rapidly and escalate out of control. And so there was only one best way to manage that problem. That was to drive Soviet means to resist and to wage war to zero. Uh, 
that was the last thing he wanted. And if you look at the way he acted in the 1958 Kimoimatsu crisis, um, he stayed his, the, his hand and kept the uh, deployed forces in the area, 7th Fleet and Pacific Air Forces, from using any weapons, conventional or uh, nuclear, against uh, the Chinese, which is what American doctrine would have called for at the time. Uh, so he was trying to prevent war from breaking out at all. And that also speaks to his strong desire to have proxies fight American wars so that Americans did not get involved and escalation could be avoided. Uh, I think another, uh, another couple of interesting points that kind of come out of this is uh, the utility of Clausewitz and classical strategic thinking uh, for thinking about even modern conflicts uh, like nuclear conflict. Uh, the interactivity that Clausewitz talks about as key to understanding war is the key to net evaluation. Uh, I think this means and will dichotomy uh, and how both are ways of winning a conflict and driving one or the other to zero uh, is important for understanding the ways in which we think about the, the use of force and what causes uh, a war to end. And Schelling's connection uh, is also drawn from Clausewitz. This connection between political and military objectives uh, propelled, uh, I think, probably the most interesting of the NESC study is the war termination study. Uh, where do you decide on how a war ends uh, and how you use military force and how it inevitably is uh, affected by political choice and how political choice affects military force? And that's uh, an interactivity that just is, continues and is continuous. Uh, I think that comes out in the NESC's studies as well. Uh, two last ideas. Uh, better outcomes aren't always good ones. Um, and sometimes they aren't even acceptable ones. And I think it took Kennedy and McNamara looking at what Eisenhower was felt he had to accept in order for them to say, we have to do something different. Yeah. So what had been just a bad outcome had become an unacceptable outcome. And so that I think is an important idea. So when sometimes uh, a nation makes a choice for what, which looks bad, um, it's kind of like Milos in the uh, uh, Peloponnesian War. Why did they fight? Because they didn't see another choice. It was the it was the best of bad choices. Uh, and then in the end, uh, I think a, a good thing is that humans don't always follow the dictates of logic. And when you base an entire idea of strategic thought and deterrence and coercion on rationality, on the opponent being able to see what is in their best interest and to not act out emotionally. Uh, it's important to remember that sometimes, as Rusk says in, uh, I think it's the uh, NESC 1963 report discussion, uh, that sometimes someone just wants to get it over with. And I think that's a, an important thing to remember that when we're looking at a historical record, trying to figure out why do people do things that are irrational, that it's inherently human. And that irrationality sometimes means that there won't be a good explanation for what happened. And it was just driven by not the dictates of logic, but by the dictates of someone being emotional. Well, that's a chilling thought uh, when you're talking about nuclear weapons and nuclear war. So, um, but Ed, thanks so much for being on the show. We've, we've taken up uh, uh, a lot of your time, um, but... Um, Thanks again for uh, for being here and for for talking through your book. Um, what are you working on next? Well, for the moment, uh, my role as a dean has uh, <laughs> occupied uh, about one hundred and thirty percent of my time. I can imagine. <laughs> uh, but uh, the projects I'd like to take on uh, in when I can return to to active academic work is. I'd like to look at McNamara's record as a nuclear strategist. I think he is underrated uh, that his reputation on Vietnam uh, has vastly overshadowed what I think uh, is a, a fascinating study of a man who thought we could use rationality to terminate war uh, and ultimately, uh, I think, understands the limits of rationality uh, by the time he leaves office in 1968. So I'd like to look at that. And then another thing I also want to look at is theories of victory uh, and how those theories of victory interact with service identities and the alignment of ends, ways, and means. Uh, so I 
uh, I think there's something there, maybe, you know, just a small paper on that one, uh, but uh, useful for some of the thinking here for our students at the War College. Yeah, that would be great. Some like fun, fun projects. So, well, thanks so much again for, um, for being on the show and um, we'll talk again soon. All right. Thank you very much. I uh, really appreciated the opportunity. All right. Bye.